I am Wonder Mike, and I've come to say hello to the black, to the white, the red, and the brown, the purple, and yellow. But first, I've got to, got to introduce our guest, <laughs> because though I think we ought to, you know, all just sort of get along and be nice to people regardless of their sex or their race, uh, the left doesn't want to let us do that. And this is especially true in entertainment. I just saw a post from the American Booksellers Association. The American Booksellers Association is hosting an, a free anti-racism workshop titled, What's Up With White Women? Unpacking Sexism and White Privilege in Pursuit of Racial Justice. Well, to help me break down this story, I, I have invited on one of these much maligned white women. <laughs> this would be Megan Basham, a uh, Rotten Tomatoes approved critic, entertainment reporter for The Daily Wire. Uh, you have uh, seen her and heard her before, and you may have seen her book, Beside Every Successful Man, out from Random House. Megan, thank you for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. So, Megan, defend yourself. I am told that white women, Karens in particular, some of the worst creatures ever to curse the face of the earth. So what do you have to say for yourself? You know, and isn't that funny? I, if, if people saw the image um, for this workshop, it had an image of a crying woman, uh, white women's tears. We hear a lot about that these days. And it was funny because for the first time it hit me that Karen is a racial slur. Right. 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 And sexual, I mean, yeah. I, and I don't I don't know why it didn't hit me before, but I thought you call us Karen's based on our skin color and our gender. So it's also misogynistic. So um, hey, could you imagine, we, Megan, if someone if uh, uh, some group of people just referred derisively to a Shaniqua said, oh, you're such a no. Shaniqua. I mean, could you imagine you would be you would be censored you'd be ostracized from society or to a uh, I don't know what's a good uh, what's a good. Uh, Hispanic name like uh, Maria or something. Oh, she's such a Maria. Such, such a Maria. Yeah. Yes. Could you could you imagine? Of course not. But uh, you know. But it's it's sort of point. I almost don't even say. Could you imagine if it were on the other foot? Because we're not living in a time that cares at all about hypocrisy. It's about hierarchies. It's some people are better than others. That's kind of the point of this intersectionality, anti-racism thing, is that white people are bad and every other kind of person is good. And that, that's it. But once you get past all the pretentious jargon, that is what is at the heart of critical race theory and its various derivations. Well, and I think when you really look at um, this organization, there, there's a backstory here that's kind of fascinating, and it's also really disturbing. Um, this summer, they they work with independent book groups, they work with independent bookstores, and they send out uh, sample books uh, for them to consider stocking shelves, and publishers pay to put books in there. And this summer, there was a huge hubbub with this organization. So first, they uh, included Abigail Schreier's book, Regnery Paid, to include Abigail Schreier's book, It's Critical of the Transgender Movement Among Children, in that book box, and people lost their minds. And they also mistook Candace Owens' book, Blackout, for another title of the same name that were written by several social justice young adult authors. It was a young adult teen romance. And they ended up apologizing for the racist violence that they perpetrated mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of booksellers to the people who received these books. So here they are putting out an organ, they're putting out an event called What's Up With White Me Women, while they're meanwhile slandering Candace Owens, slandering Abigail Schreier, saying that they are racist and violent. And, uh, and then they have, ironically, two white women leading this seminar and then to get even a little further into the irony about this whole organization, which is very influential within the publishing business. They've been around for over 100 years. They have very deep roots. Um, they host something called Banned Books Week. It's going on right now. CNN is covering it. So after this whole thing happened this summer, they promised they would never send their members books like that again. And now they're <laughs> celebrating Banned Books Week. I guess I should say celebrating because now they're a part of banning books. Right. You know, it, it's funny because in a way, this is this was kind of the premise of my book that I recently came out with, which I suspect the American Booksellers Association doesn't care for very much, which is... They would lose it. <laughs> you know, we have, have long talked a good game on how it's terrible to ban books or we should never do that and everything. We should have total free speech absolutism. But that has never existed anywhere, to my mind. And it's, we know that the left are hypocrites on this. But, but conservatives, I think, should recognize 
There's nothing particularly conservative about saying that uh, we ought to, you know, encourage any sort of book, whether it's obscene or vicious or, or anything like that. I mean, there's, there's book burning in the Bible. Plato advocates for book burning, for goodness sakes. I mean, every society has some kinds of standards and, and taboos. And it seems to me what the left has done, and they've gone, they've gone into the American Booksellers Association, and they've just changed all the standards and taboos. And, and now they're, they're holding these anti-racism seminars, obviously, to promote racism. The thing that's really weird to me, though, is I think white women read books, don't they? Aren't, don't they buy books? Why are they turning off this huge segment of their customer base? Not only do they buy books, they are actually um, the largest demographic of book buyers. So this is really kind of a very poor uh, business move for a, a group, a industry, independent booksellers that are dying. They're struggling yeah. to stay, up, stay alive. And this is their reaction to that. It's really hard to wrap your mind around what they're thinking. But I think they would say that the type of books that they want to protect in the public space is in schools. There, We've seen a lot of stories lately about pornographic material being in books for children, and they want to protect those in school libraries and school classrooms. So those are the kind of books that they're advocating for at the ABA. Right. It, Candace Owens, a black woman, saying, think for yourself, that's got to be banned. That you've got to burn at the pyre in the center of the community. But some filthy degenerate porn, like you're seeing in the Fairfax County mm -hmm. schools, that should be assigned to third graders. That's be, that, I'm being only slightly hyperbolic. That, that is the argument that we're hearing from these people. That is the argument. You know, moving on from the uh, white women, <laughs> I, I want to be fair. I want to give e equal time here to that other evil, rotten, terrible group white men. Now I say this, my, I guess I'm a white man. I'm a little swarthy. I don't know quite, quite where I fall on that scale. But, <laughs> but I was uh, reading not just on some random post from the American Booksellers Association. I was reading about the evils of white men in, a, in a, actually a more sophisticated publication, Scientific American. Scientific American just came out and uh, they, they attacked the Jedi the the <laughs> mythical series of you know group of heroes in the Star Wars movies apparently some social justice warriors have adopted this phrase Jedi for themselves because they support justice and equity and diversity and inclusion get it waka waka so they're calling <laughs> themselves Jedi and Scientific American is saying no Je that's that's bad Jedi are are upholders of the patriarchal cisgender white normative or whatever nonsense they spout. And uh, actually, we've got to, we've got to cancel Luke Skywalker. Well, you know, it's really fascinating to look at this story. So I wrote up an article on this. And uh, when I was looking at it, I went, we're running out of things to cancel because who doesn't love Star Wars that we're now we've now gotten to the bottom of the barrel where we have to complain about using Star Wars. But I do think that there's something a little bit bigger behind this story. And that's that when you look at the American imagination, when you look at the kinds of stories that we have as a culture loved for decades, the left is going to have to start changing those kind of stories because Star Wars itself is a group of liberty, valuing individual freedom fighters going against the Leviathan. They're going against the central power. That's not a story that an authoritarian movement is going to love. So it feels very specific that you're starting to see them turn. We, we've already turned against your John Wayne, your Westerns. And in a way, Star Wars is the inheritor of that Western mm -hmm. imagination. Um, so I'm looking at this story going, not only that, it's, yes, it's, it's Eastern mysticism a little bit, but it's also a story of a religious re reawakening of people who are starting mm -hmm. to go, maybe there's something bigger than the state out there. Maybe some bigger force has control over what happens in our lives. Mm. None of these things are the kind of things that your social justice warriors of today are going to be really hip on. Also, since when is Yoda a white guy? I thought he was a green guy. Right? I didn't know he was a guy at all. I thought he was some kind of animal. But but I, it does. I, I guess it does show you. Yes, I I, I agree with your points. I, I think that's a, a great observation. That in order for the left to transform the country, they've got to change all of the stories. But then there's even this battle amongst themselves for what. What does the story mean? You know, on mm. the one hand, they, they see that the, the Jedi in Star Wars are the good guys. So they want to take on, they want to associate themselves with the good guys in the movies. But because they're not the good guys, because in real life, they're the bad guys, they've also then got to attack the good guys and they've got to make the bad guys the good guys. It's a very complicated process. 
It really is. And, you know, I always kind of enjoy these stories when you really dig down into what's happening with culture, what's happening with the larger myths that we tell ourselves. Uh, Because I find it really fascinating that it used to be white guys who were kind of dominated the science world and they love stories of space and anything that sort of feeds into that scientific genre that they live in. And suddenly they're saying, you don't really get to have this anymore. You don't get to think that the stories you grew up on are cool anymore. We're going to take that away from you too. And we're going to absorb you into the collective hive mind. And that's what's happening to me. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. And so people are tuning this out. You see this in a lot of different places, but n- nobody watched the Emmy Awards the other night. Even I, I mean, it's, it, is, it is my job to cover events like the Emmy Awards. I get a paycheck on the assumption that I will watch events like the Emmy Awards. And I'm glad Shapiro's out today so he can't hear this. I didn't. I didn't. I can't bring myself <laughs> to, that's no paycheck is worth it. And, and certainly people who weren't being paid did, did not watch it. And, and by the way, at the Emmy Awards, you were seeing a difference between the ruling class and the ruled. At the Emmy Awards, even though there's an LA mask mandate, people weren't wearing masks. They were in an enclosed space, but they weren't wearing masks. And they were prattling on about how the rest of us need to wear masks. And I wonder if that, if that plays a little bit into it as well, that the, the makers of culture are their own insular elite group in a way that is disconnected from the people and in a way that is different than, than we've seen in the past in America. And uh, how long can they sustain that before they, they lose whatever influence they, they now retain? I don't know. I guess, you know, ask 18th century France, how long can you sustain this? How long does it go on before people start to realize that we're not playing by the same rules here? And uh, I, I feel like the images coming out of those events, the Met Gala, the Emmy Awards, they're getting pretty stark. I mean, it, you have to bend yourself into some pretty big pretzels to make yourself as the elite, wealthy, millionaire class into somehow being oppressed. Right. I mean, they're trying very hard. And I will say, it was if I did have to watch, you know, I'm, I'm not Michael Knowles, so my paycheck still <laughs> requires me to watch You're specifically watch the on the entertainment beat. That's true. <laughs> but... Um, so it was a little less political, except for the images that came out of it were just, I, I mean, you can't get more Marie Antoinette than seeing all the help in the background masked while the rich and fabulous Megan, going I've got to stop you there. Carpet. I've got to stop you there. That is deeply unfair to Marie Antoinette. Okay, Marie Antoinette, <laughs> compare, you're going to compare them to, to these degenerates in Hollywood? Oh my God, there's no comparison to be had. They're so, they're so much worse and, and, uh, the 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 di- difference, you know, even between the <laughs> French monarchy and the sort of peasants in the 19th century, it, it would seem that the asymmetries of power are even starker, <laughs> perhaps here today. At least when you're talking about the cultural front. Well, I, I mean, then you think about this: that you go, who had to cover their faces there? Everyone had to be vaccinated, and so it wasn't just that they had to mask; it's that they had to go through all the same hoops. And it was purely performative. So it was almost a sign of submission because everyone who attended that event had to take a negative COVID test. They had to be vaccinated. So they had already jumped through all those hoops. And yet for the imagery, they still had to cover their faces. I mean, there's something very almost sinister about that. Right. And, and you, you can't, by the way, th- what they like to do is say the reason that we still have these COVID measures is because of all the conservative white men and white women, Karen. And but actually, that's not, that's not what's playing out. You've, this is slightly unrelated, and we, we do have to pause it. But you, you, know, you have uh, black basketball players just, just a couple days ago saying, no, we, we don't want to take the vaccine. You, you, you have people showing up to their school boards who are not just white men and white women you know, showing up and saying, we want this filth out of our schools, the gender ideology, this race racism called anti-racism. I I think it's cracking that narrative in a way that's going to be really hard for them to support. We've got to leave it there. Megan Basham, people need to follow you at The Daily Wire. They need to follow you everywhere else. Where can they find you on social media? Uh, I'm on Twitter mostly at at Meg Basham. So I hang around in that cesspool. Come follow me. Go follow. Do not (laughs) let the fact that that Megan is a white woman stop you from following her She's one of the good ones. I actually don't think they're that bad in general. Megan, thank you for being here.